Welcome back to another Zero Context Patreon. Start advertising my Patreon content one out of context theater moment at a time. I finished up the maiden ship before jumping into the first book of the Janitor series, simply named Janitors. And that's all I was able to get through this month. Dan later sneaks into his father's cabin and searches for where the key might belong to. The entire thing is so inevitably boring, and it's a struggle to actually read and to not simply skip over the entire epic thing. Yes, yeah, this is accurate to how real-life people would go and search the room, but holy guacamole, it doesn't make for a good story. She spoke the common tongue well, only a mild Irvmanian accent edging her words. This is an irrelevant note since we don't know where Emania is, nor do we know what this accent sounds like. I normally wouldn't care, but this book is drowning with purple prose. And what's worse is that the author puts as much weight on Dan finding the baby picture of himself among his dad's things as he does the fact that the masthead is a cursed princess, which means that literally everything is important, but that means that literally nothing is important. It's only after this that Tuff finally bothers to get back to what little plot that there actually is. He begins the story of when he was a young boy, to which Mo is like, Get to the goddamn point already! You know you've got too much padding when the characters practically break the fourth wall to complain about this. I'm not sure how Captain Alloway found us or how he even knew who we were, but he tracked us down on his first afternoon in Talhoot. He promised to help get us out. He told us that there was a safe haven for people, people like us. He didn't tell us where it was. He only said that it would take us there. He said the stalkers couldn't reach it, neither by night or day. He told us it could become our, our home. So, real question time. Mo said that they were hunted through the port town, but the stalkers only fell back once they got to sea. This indicates that the stalkers have some sort of aversion to the water, for whatever reason. But yet, these things are on islands all over the place, which indicates that they clearly traveled there. So is there, like, a magical way that they travel, or is this yet another overlooked plot hole since the author basically vanity published? Hiram Alway would have never taken with a prostitute. Considering how important Hiram has been to the plot, alive or not, the narration sure took its sweet time actually giving him a freaking name. Casper and Toph say that the men weren't exactly worth the fight, and the fact that they even managed to get a blow on Dan was only because they had the element of surprise. They think that all three men are tied up in something worse than a slave brothel. Dan worries that if the stalkers are employing humans to do the work that they cannot, that not even the safe haven is safe anymore. Casper comes to check on the captain. The known player stands and openly flirts with Sable, but Dan feels a streak of jealousy over this. He has to remind himself that he doesn't own Sable. <sighs> this book is being way too obvious. In the end, it was decided that Toph should go to the port with Dan rather than Sable. The idea is that if something happened to Sable, then Dan would be completely screwed, which is fair enough, I suppose. But that only raises the question of how Sable would know when to bring all three of them back, assuming that they were successful. Accustomed to the smooth sway of the sea, any sailor would find the hard thump of a carriage inconvenient. So I know that no editor touched this, what with it being a vanity project and everything, but at the same time, why the frick frack paddywhack was there an epping dash in this sentence? What exactly does the author think that the dash is accomplishing here? You mean the thug that accosted you in indoor vid? Sable asked a question that Dan knew was on Moe's lips as well. Yes, girl, he just landed in the harbor and he has a small army of brigands with him. The house contains 35 souls in total and we cannot evacuate them all in time. Even if we did, where would they go? Most of them are women and the men that are here cannot fight. Do the fucking police not exist in this world? Go tell the effing police. I cannot with how fucking stupid that they are. Wow, an angry guy raised a mob to come attack me, the richest guy in town, in my own home. Whatever should we do? Go to the effing police, moron. The room had a secret entrance, the sort you always find in storybook mansions. The stupidest part about this line is that the kind of house that Dan lives in is the kind of house that the reason why there is the secret door in an old manor house cliche in the first place. Storybook mansions? You literally live in one! Some more stuff is largely glossed over. It's like the author is bored with her own work despite the fact that there's a couple more books after this. It kind of makes me wonder why she even bothered at all. Like, anyway, literally none of this stuff on the first three pages is remotely important, so don't worry about it. Instead of the happy reunion that I think everybody was expecting, Dan is instead pissed as hell that his mom has been lying to him for the past eight years, which is fair, and I can't say that I want to be angry if I was in the same situation. His mom calls to him from the kitchen and demands to know how his day went, but not only is she making dinner, but she's also on the phone with her sister, Aunt Avril. Despite this, she still wants to know about Spencer's day. He starts to tell her the usual stuff, but when it becomes obvious that she isn't actually listening, she starts to tell her stuff like, Aliens invaded and gave us all ray weapons! 
It was only a ten minute break, but at least it was ten minutes that Spencer could get away from Dez's grubby hands. The big bully had been poking Spencer all morning. His trip to the principal's office obviously hadn't been enough to inspire good behavior. My mom is a retired teacher, and she spent the last 20 years working in three different elementary schools. Let me tell you that a stern talking to from the principal is 100% going to do nothing to stop a bully. Bullies often need intensive therapy, seeing as how the entire cliche of it starts at home is often true. However, in order for the therapy to be effective, they need help from their parents. But since the parent is often the problem, help is almost impossible unless some outside force acts upon the child. From the perspective of a 6th grader, this storyline makes sense. We're often subjected to bullies and teachers can be quite oblivious, especially a sub. But from the perspective of an adult who knows how the education system slash child psychology works, bully subplots only make me sad. I'm a little worried about you, she said. I don't know what Miss Natcher usually tolerates, but you've been kind of disruptive today. Now, I won't tell her about this or about how you slept through math, but I surely hope that you weren't trying to make a scene. Oh, she calls it the kid who is having a few minor issues. But the boy who literally scribbled on another student's face in front of her gets 100% off scot-free. Like, look, lady, I know that you're a sub and everything, but holy guacamole, this behavior is unacceptable. I am once again asking what the adults were doing this entire time. There is no way that the cafeteria aides failed to notice a boy being chased out from the cafeteria by another student. And the playground aides? You think that they would notice kids dogpiling on another kid and pouring rotten milk over him. I see creatures in the school. Some are slimy, some are furry, some have wings. I don't know why the rest of you can't see them. I'm trying to figure that out. I don't want to freak you guys out, but I had to tell you what I've seen. Dead silence. Then like an avalanche. Laughter. Laughter! Even Miss Natcher was chuckling in her own stuffy way. I get the children laughing over the entire thing, but a child, a literal 12-year-old child, confessed to her that he was seeing things that the other children cannot. And this woman who is supposed to have taken psychology classes and earned a master's degree is openly laughing at this literal child. The glove is a dangerous item that we recovered from a raid of Walter Jameson's last experiment station. Jameson, it seems, somehow knew that we were coming and was gone by the time that we got here, much like today, in fact. Then maybe don't make an appointment and loudly announce to everybody that you're coming. He meets up with Daisy where they go to the gym together. There's no windows in there, so Spencer turns on the flashlight. As Hadley had said, the beam is stupid dim and they can barely see anything with it. But then a really bright light shifts to spotlight one of the bats. As the bat moves, so does the beam of light, even though Spencer isn't moving the flashlight. The imposter recess aide had given Spencer a slip of paper that he presented to Mrs. Natcher after lunch. What's this? Miss Natcher took the note, plucking it out of Spencer's hand with two fingers. She unfolded it and read out loud, Please excuse Spencer, Zumbro, Daisy Gates, and Des Riley for their unexpected disappearance from class this morning. I had quite a discussion with them in my office. The issue has been resolved. Principal Poach. Mrs. Natcher raised her eyebrows. I hope you three learned your lesson. The principal is known to be harsh when occasion arises. The note had nearly convinced Daisy that she'd actually been to the principal's office. I was down with the idea that this little girl is so trusting because she's innocent, but this, this, this kind of seems like some kind of deeper psychological issue that should probably be addressed before it becomes a big problem. Spencer felt comfortable in the Gates' home. Aside from it being ten times quieter than his house, Spencer felt relaxed and accepted there. Daisy, being an only child, received more attention from her parents in one day than Spencer did in a month. I'm not saying that parents of multiple children can't give individual attention to their children. What I'm saying is that the singular instance in which Spencer interacted with his mom, she acted like she somehow had better things to be doing than listening to her kid, despite the fact that she demanded that he tell her about his day. You've got some explaining to do, Mrs. Natcher dragged her across the cafeteria, Daisy struggling uselessly to get away. Then out of nowhere, Des Riley appeared, a heaping bowl of mostly melted ice cream in his hand. Gullible Gates, Des's eyes narrowed to a glare of revenge. I can't find your boyfriend, so I'll have to settle for you. With one swift motion, the bully shoved the bowl of dripping ice cream into Daisy's face. Literally in front of the teacher? Jeez, come on, man. Mr. Hadley is indeed a licensed member of the BEM, Mrs. Hamp said. Last Thursday, he arrived at the school to perform a routine inspection after the school had been vacated. If your son did meet Mr. Hadley that day, it would have been due to his lack of obedience in exiting the school when the final bell rang. Literally none of this is addressing Alice's concern over why an adult is asking for the help of a literal child. I mean, your dad's got to come back. Nobody loves their work more than their family. Please never take this innocence away from this sweet child. Grounded from the computer, and my mom wasn't happy about me emailing without permission. Really? 
that's the hell your mom is going to be on. How dare you email without permission and not an adult took advantage of you and convinced you to do bad things. But you can't experiment unless you get the hammer back, Daisy reminded him. Walter smiled. Oh, we will get it back. We'll help Spencer off it again. We already have the BEMs. Trust, we could trick Hadley and... No, Walter snapped. His face suddenly looked extra weary. We've already been over this. I don't want you two getting involved any deeper than you already are. Spencer felt a pang of hurt. Didn't Walter trust him? It's not so much that Walter and Marv don't trust him. What they're saying is that this isn't a job for children. It should never have been the job of children. In his backpack, Spencer had the keys to their success. It was the printed email, including his original message and Garth Hadley's response. Spencer had kept it a secret from everyone, even Daisy. At the end of training with the janitors today, Spencer would present the information to Walter Jameson, Garth Hadley's local hideout. At least Spencer has enough common sense to hand the info over to the adults. There's still way too much book, though. You know that the kids are going to get dragged into this, too. Poach could call the cops and they could stop the janitor napping that was happening in the middle hall. Normally, I would completely agree, but this man completely and utterly disregarded all measures of ensuring that literal students weren't harmed, ignored the children warning him that these adults are preying on them, and also failed to notify parents about punishments. Actually, now that I think about it, he totally sounds like one of those Nepo hires my mom's old school district would not stop putting into power. My poor mother was literally chased from not one but two schools because of this. But Miss Charmel's a girl. She can't go in the boys' bathroom. Yes, but she has the teacher exception to the gendered bathroom rule. If you like my content, you can become a member on Patreon. You can drink for free and get access to all my free stuff. For only $1 a month, you can have access to so much, including the context for all of this month's commentary and more. I'll see you next month, guys.